As you're well aware, we're living in unprecedented times. Join us now for today's special program. I want to spend my life mending broken people. I want to spend my life removing pain. Lord, let my words heal a heart that hurts. I want to spend. friends, welcome to 3ABN Today. My name is John Lomakang, and to my right is my lovely wife. How are you doing, honey? I'm doing great. I'm blessed and thankful to God for a beautiful new day. And as the saying goes, any day above the ground is a good day. And you work on radio, so they might want to know yeah. what your name is. <laughs> my name is Angela Lomakang. <laughs> <laughs> we are so thankful that you've taken the time to tune in to join us for a very interesting uh, thought-provoking program about how God never stops leading. That's right. And our guest today is a young man you'll get a chance to meet in just a moment. But you know, where you are today is mm -hmm. not where you may be a year from now or maybe right. a month from now mm -hmm. because God's providence sees us where we are and mm -hmm. when we are not where He wants us to be, He doesn't stop leading and guiding until we get to that wonderful place. So I'm excited about the program today, honey. Yeah, I am too, because this person is affiliated with radio. And as many of you know, I work for 3ABN Radio. And I'm excited about uh, our guest today. <laughs> okay, and the topic, we're trying to keep away from the topic, but thank you well, for your prayers yes. and your financial support of this network as we continue going and growing, getting ready for the coming of the Lord. Before we introduce him, we're going to go ahead and uh, go to some music to encourage your heart. Who do we have today, honey? I love her name. Her name is Mary Grace. And the song is a very familiar song. People need the Lord.
Thank you so much, Mary, for that wonderful song, People Need the Lord. It's a timeless yeah. song. And but playing with one hand. Yeah, she's what we call other able. You know, yes. a lot of times people say people are disabled, but when you hear the way she plays, Beautiful. that is not a disability, Thank that is a gift. Thank you so much, Mary, for glorifying God uh, with the challenge that she has, yes. and what an amazing song. Every time I hear her play, I always ask myself, what is my excuse? <laughs> Thank you for blessing our hearts. Amen. Well, today we have as our guest, Samson Fidemaye. Good to have you here, Samson. Thank yes. you, John. <laughs> yes, welcome to 3ABN. I'm assuming this is your first time here. This is my first time, yes. Wow, wow, wow. You have an, an interesting story. We kind of had a chance to mm -hmm. look over where we're headed today in our interview with you. And I want to just start by asking you, uh, where were you born? Let's just go ahead and begin at the born beginning. Born and raised. Yeah, far away from here. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I was born in Nigeria, and Nigeria is in West Africa. Okay. Yeah. Nigeria, and, um, West Africa. Mm. Tell me a little bit about the climate of your birth, because a lot of times, People think, well, where he was born has a lot to do with who he has become. Mm. But that is true to some degree mm. and not true to others. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about uh, your country. So uh, the climate is tropical. It's, it's a trop tropical country, so we don't have snow. Mm. I, like, I like to start with that because uh, snow has been quite a challenge in the winter months for me. But uh, it's tropical again, and we have lots of warm weather, dry weather throughout the year, lots of sunshine, so we don't have to depend on uh, vitamin D supplements or anything. Mm -hmm. So you have lots of sunshine and uh, lots of rain as well. So we have what we call the dry season and the raining season. Those are the two seasons we have. So mm -hmm. the dry season, it's all dry, sunny. The raining season, still sunshine, but lots of rain as well. Okay. Mm. Now, we've been to Africa several times, haven't we? Mm -hmm. And we've really enjoyed visiting the many countries in that continent. Now, what was it like growing up in Nigeria? Uh, yeah, uh, my childhood was mostly playing outdoors, and we would do simple mm -hmm. games. Yeah. Uh, so we'd ride like car tires on the streets, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah. with our hands or with a stick. And usually we did that almost naked, like we just had our pants on as children. So, mm -hmm. um, but apart from that, we did play some indoor games as well, because uh, I had siblings. Uh, so How we, many? Five siblings uh, when my parents were done. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but earlier on in my early childhood, it was just me and my elder brother, because I'm the second of six. Ah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we would play like table soccer. Yes. Um, with uh, the, co the bot bottle covers, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll make them into players and just play table soccer. And uh, what else did we do? At some point, my parents did buy a PlayStation game for us when they could afford it. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. But uh, you have a picture of you when you were growing up, when you were a young boy. Uh -huh. Kind of uh, tell us a, tell us what we're seeing here, for just for those who are maybe listening on the radio. Yeah, so uh, I'm from actually an Islamic background, and uh, all of my siblings and my parents, they are Muslims, mm -hmm. even up to this point as we are talking. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, it was pretty much a very structured life, or should I say defined life. Mm -hmm. So I knew that I had to pray five times daily, because that's the Islamic uh, way of prayer. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I did attend Arabic school, uh, uh, aside from my Western education. So I, I went to that after, every time I came back from my elementary school, I would mm -hmm. go to this Arabic school where I get taught how to read the Quran. Mm. So, and then we had uh, Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, the best month of the year for Muslims. Mm. And I actually do miss that because it's a time when family really comes together. Hmm. So, um, wow. yeah, and there's the other one that is quite, quite similar to Ramadan, though you're not fasting this time, but it's also a time family is united. It's called homecoming hmm. in my language, and it is in reference to the story of Abraham mm -hmm. uh, when he went uh, to sacrifice his child. But in Islam, the child is not Isaac. The child is Ishmael, okay. according to the Islamic narrative. So when God says, don't sacrifice the child, I'm gonna give you a substitute so you can go home with your child. So that's why it's called homecoming in my language, homecoming. Mm. But the child is not Isaac. According to Islam, the child is Ishmael. Yeah, isn't that something? That's interesting. I, I yeah. wonder, and I just wanna ask this question, how, how do they arrive at that? Because we know scripturally in the 
Christian narrative, it's not Ishmael, it's Isaac. Right. Do you have any idea of that? You know, that question, I've had it for a while as well, but then when I realized that uh, according to uh, the Christian faith, Isaac is the child of promise. Mm -hmm. and, and I begin to see that um, it makes sense if Islam says it's Ishmael because we know that the descendants of, of Muslims come from that lineage of mm -hmm. Ishmael. So, yeah. yeah, I think it's just tradition or something. Yes. You were brought up in a Muslim home. What was it like in that home? You told us a little bit about being raised in a Muslim home. Um, did you have worships every day? Did, did you pray five times a day as the Muslims do? Uh, how was that like? Yeah, uh, I think of the kids, I was probably the most uh, faithful to that uh, in my late teens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but as a child, it was kind of like, you know, scanty because you're yeah. not really into the thing yet. Right. But when I became uh, my mid Teens, my teenage life, I became very serious with it. And I actually remember that uh, our corridor, the corridor, corridor of my yes. home, mm -hmm. uh, I converted it into a mini mosque oh. for us to pray because I noticed that everybody prayed like separately, like right. in their rooms and yeah. things like that. And at that time in my life, I was very serious about my faith. Mm. And I felt like, why can't we all pray together or pray in a defined place in a specific location in the house? And I thought about the corridor and I transformed it into a mini mosque. And then I had pictures of Hala um, on the walls and things like that, yeah. Mm. So I was pretty serious at some point with it, yeah. How do you, what times of day do you decide to pray? Because five times a day, how do you break that down? I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. Is it a predefined? Yeah, yeah, it's predefined. Uh, it's at specific times of the day. So the first one is before sunrise. Okay. Yeah, you have the first call to prayer and then the first prayer. Then the second one is at 2 p.m. Um, mm. uh, in the afternoon. And then you have uh, the next one at 4 in the afternoon, 4 p.m. And then the next one is uh, 7 p.m. And the last one is at 8 p.m. And the one in the morning before sunrise is called uh, Zuboi, and the, the one at uh, 2 is called Zur, the one at 4 is called Ashri, the one at 7 p.m. is called Maghrib, and the one at 8 is called Ishai. So it's defined, yeah. Wow. I wonder, because I'm, I'm learning something now. I, mm -hmm. I mean, I've heard and I've seen. I, I remember being in Trinidad. I was thinking of that. <laughs> we, were, we were in Trinidad a number of years ago visiting, and early in the morning, we heard the call to prayer through this megaphone, this very loud, loudspeaker. <laughs> yeah. And it startled me, but the people in whose house we were staying, they were so used to it. And <laughs> people in the community, just, you know, if they're not Muslim, they remain in bed and it doesn't even bother them. <laughs> I called 911. <laughs> I, I didn't know what was going no. on. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I was a, this, <laughs> it was kind of funny. Yeah. There's something going on, I don't know what it is. And they said, oh, you get used to yeah. it. It's, the, it's, it's the call to prayer. Yeah. 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 But I always wonder why they choose those times of day. And um, I don't know how, uh, you mentioned the time, so I'll kind of leave it there unless there's a specific reason why they chose those times of day. It's, it's tradition again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this, you know, Islam is based on how uh, the Prophet Muhammad, you know, uh, lived his life. Actually, it's, it's the way of the Prophet. Everything he did is the uh, definition of Islam for everyone. So when they follow that, it's based on the tradition they left behind. There may be a reason for the specific time spot. It's just what we were told and that's what we did. Okay. Now I want to show a picture here and have you explain what we're seeing. This is your family? Oh, your family. Yeah. Yes. And uh, you see also a yellow and a white uh, thing over there because there are two people behind uh, those colors that are not being seen right now because they don't want to be seen. And those are my sisters, my, the only girls in the family. Mm -hmm. They're actually twins, by the way. Okay. Yeah, so identical twins. Identical. Yeah, so I respected their uh, uh, request, desire. their desire not to be revealed. And there's a reason for that. They don't mind me sharing that. Sure. So um, at some point when they became uh, adults, mm -hmm. so when they were kids growing up, there was no issue. I mean, they wouldn't mind taking pictures or you right. showing your pictures. Uh, by the time they went to college, and before that as well, before they went to college, they dressed like every normal you know, teenage girl. Right. But when they got to college, uh, they began to have deeper convictions about Islam uh -huh. and how they dressed. 
and they decided to dress in a certain Islamic way. Oh. So in that picture, they were not dressing that way yet. They dressed oh, in a regular way in that picture, but now because they dress in this Islamic way, based on their deep convictions about Islam today, they don't want people to see how they used to dress yeah. and they don't want to be shown. Yeah. Oh, okay. They don't understand that. Mm -hmm. Right, they don't want to see, right, yeah. they want to, the former way of right. living. Yeah. Right, right. So that's no longer who we are. Yep. Now, what significant childhood experience did you have growing up? So, uh, my parents unintentionally uh, developed certain fears in me and made yes. me a very fearful child. Uh, because, of course, everyone is different, and I have a very sensitive nature, and I've discovered that all, all my life that I do have that. And as a child, that really was very obvious because my parents unintentionally, again, they brought home these movies, mm -hmm. and they, they are cultural movies. Mm -hmm. uh, we call them home videos, and right. they promoted things like witchcraft and mm -hmm. life after death. And they were very vivid images, um, very dark things. Yeah. And so I, I would consume these things as a child with my mom, who was very fond of these kind of movies. And I noticed that I couldn't even, uh, I mean, and in Nigeria, we don't have constant electricity. Okay. Yeah, so okay. They, they would seize the power every now and then, and there would be probably darkness in the night. Oh, boy. And I just <laughs> couldn't be alone in the dark. I mean, it's already fearful enough, but for a child who had seen such things, you know, True. so many times I would have those pictures in my mind and I couldn't, in fact, till I was uh, about 15, 16, 17 thereabouts, I couldn't stay in a home by myself. I couldn't live in a house just by myself, even at 15, wow. 16, 17 years of age. So that was how strong those fears were. So because I would be like, what's going to happen to me if I'm alone and things like that. Yeah. Yes. So I had a very fearful childhood. When in fact, wow. the fear was really in your mind. Yeah. It's amazing, and I'm glad you brought that up because a lot of times people They're don't think that what they see conditions the way they think. Mm -hmm. And we had some friends visiting <laughs> us from New York. We, yeah. we live out here in the country, <laughs> uh, very you know, wide open country, and it's dark at night generally. And we yeah, had some friends visiting dark. from New York during mm -hmm. one of our camp meetings. <laughs> it wasn't maybe 15 or 20, well, actually about 30 feet from our front door to their car, and they said, could you walk us to the car? And we said, why? They said, it's dark. We can't see anything. <laughs> I said, you have more to fear in the big cities than you do out here in the country. Mm, exactly. But once again, it's the mindset. It's, the mindset. Yeah. it's amazing that with a Muslim background, yeah. uh, well, the con did the convictions later on become stronger that those movies didn't continue? Or was it just a tradition? Was it just something your mom or family did at that time? You mean the movies? The movies, was it based on the Islamic beliefs? Or no, just no, no, no. Uh, I wonder if it was. I don't know. W was there any connection to those, the belief yeah. system? It was basically cultural, though. Okay. Uh, it was cultural, because there were no Muslim movies. They were just cultural movies okay. in my language, cultural. done by my people. And, and, and the, the worldview in those movies are actually the worldview of my people. Hmm. Yeah, they believe that there is life after death. And Does Muslims like believe that? that? Life after death? Yeah, Muslims actually have interesting beliefs about life after death. I may be able to share that. But one of them that I should probably share right yeah. now is what happens in terms of your prayer life as a Muslim. Yeah. So when you die, your prayers actually follow you to the grave. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, your faithfulness to your five daily prayers. And there was a time in my junior high school that I was really taught about this concept that when I die as a Muslim, if I was faithful to my five daily prayers, they would come visit me uh, personified in my grave hmm. at those time periods. Oh. So the morning prayer would come, the afternoon prayers would come, the evening prayers would come personified in persons uh, in my grave, and they would keep me comfort. They would give me comfort in my grave after my death. But if I was unfaithful to my five daily prayers, they would also come personified to actually torment me in my grave. Yeah. Wow. And that's Islamic tradition. It's, it's, it's an Islamic tradition, it's believed. I don't know why it's in the Quran, because Islam is not just based on the Quran alone. There are lots of hadiths as well, which are kind of like the sayings of the prophet and things like that, mm -hmm. and some other uh, recognized figures during that period. So those sayings are called hadiths, and those things are actually as, they're taken as serious as the Quran. So those are traditions that are believed to be true. Hmm. Yeah. Now I have a question. Do they believe that Jesus is a prophet? What, is it? What's what do they believe? Th that's basically the belief that he's a prophet, yes. That he's a prophet. He's one of the prophets. They consider him a special prophet, 
uh, because it did certain miracles and it was kind of unique in, in, in the way it was born as well. So even the virgin birth is recognized in Islam you know, as they well. They recognize that, yeah. okay. Now, I want to show a few more pictures here, then I'm going to go to the transitional part of your story. This is pretty interesting. Mm. Let's look at the next picture and, and identify to our viewing audience what we're seeing here. Oh, yeah, this is uh, my college, my first college. Okay. Yeah. Now, this is significant. What's the name yeah. of the college? It's called Babcock. Okay. Now, when you were there, were you still Muslim? So I went in there as a Muslim who was um, not satisfied with Islam. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Why, why, why were you not satisfied with Islam? Yeah, because just before this college, maybe two years before, uh -huh. I had a huge problem actually because I had to live in my uncle for a little time. Yeah. So I left home to a different city, mm -hmm. actually a different state where my uncle was because I had to take my examination, the one that would help me get into college. I had to retake it one more time. So I was with my uncle and this time there was no one to be with me at home when my uncle left. Right. And this was just like two years before college and I still couldn't live by myself in the house oh. because of these fears. Hmm. So I had these very personal fears. I needed a personal guard right. that would help me deal with all of these fears I had as a child, even in my teenage life. So uh, while I was there, I knew that I needed something stronger. I needed something personal, a personal guard. So when I came into the college, I knew that I needed to overcome those fears somehow. And Islam wasn't giving me those tools. Mm. So I was dissatisfied with Islam when I was in that college. Now you had a dream, didn't you? I had a dream as a child, actually. Share that dream with us. Yeah, because uh, during that same period when I, in my childhood, when I would be so fearful because of what I was exposed to, I would also have very uh, scary dreams. Hmm. Yeah, and these dreams were very vivid because they happened in the setting of the home where we were living. So in my dream, I see myself just around our house being chased around by some very scary looking thing, like some demon or something. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember these dreams happened a number of times, not just once, a number of times. Then I remember during that same period, at least one time, because I remember vividly, there was at least one time when I dreamt that I was in my room actually inside my room, and there was this angelic being that came into the room. And I could recognize that being because I'd seen posters of Jesus mm -hmm. in my Christian saturated community because we lived in a very Christian saturated community. So there were okay. many churches around and they had these posters of Jesus. But that particular dream happened around the same time I would have those dreams that would scare me to death. And uh, this being came into the room very angelic, bright, and looked just like the Jesus I'd seen in the posters. And he offered his hand to me, mm. like saying, come. Yeah. And that dream was, a very, uh, good, was very good for me because I kept that picture in my mind whenever I felt afraid. Mm. Uh, many years after, that, that picture remained in my mind. Yeah. And, and that helped in your transition because at the college that we just saw, you started transitioning away from Islam to Christianity. Yeah, in fact, I first did not, I didn't actually plan to do that. I just knew Islam wasn't for me really because it wasn't helping me as a person and I didn't believe that it was gonna help me overcome my fears and everything. So, but I wasn't automatically thinking about Christianity. Right. Um, yeah, so I think for a while, what I actually just did was just live life as it came and I got involved in lots of music uh, with my friends and what worldly stuff we would do a lot of worldly stuff i think i tried to drown my fears mm. with uh, a very worldly lifestyle mm. yeah oh my. that's amazing so you're in a you're in a christian school or an environment where there are multiple religions yeah but yeah. your friends start becoming influential in some degree and then your dedication to islam started lightening up it was kind of like the uh, I think the way I think of it is the bridge between two points. Like between Zimbabwe and Zambia, there's a bridge over Victoria Falls. It's called right. No Man's Land. <laughs> and so you uh. were leaving one, and, uh, but not all the way in the other. That's quite an experience. Yeah. But you had some uh, challenges here. Yeah, and I should say at this college is where I yeah. met my Adventist friend. Um, actually, I had two friends. One of them was a Pentecostal Christian, like an Evangelical Christian Sunday. And the other grew up from in an Adventist family. Oh. And both of them were 
like we were th bodies, like my, I was like here and they were like that, very close friends. But outside those two friends, those two Christian friends, the Adventist and the Evangelical Christian, I had all of my worldly friends mm -hmm. that, that we did stuff together that I tried to drown my fears in and everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but the influence of my two Christian friends that were closest to me, which I, I think God made that happen because the, that wouldn't have happened if not for God, because I had all of these worldly friends that were really into that. Mm -hmm. But these two Christian friends were a little bit different. Huh. Yeah, they, they were not perfect, but they were so different from my other friends that I took notice of them. Mm -hmm. And they noticed that I like to talk about spiritual things because, of course, somebody who grew up in my, in my kind of background, I have a very spiritual background. So I was interested in spiritual conversations mm. and I would talk, talk with them about spiritual things. And um, of course, they were Christians, so they would speak about the Bible a lot. And I had not studied the Bible by this time. Mm. So they challenged me to study the Bible, both of them. And that's what I did. Wow. Yeah. Did you have obstacles when you were becoming a Christian? To share with us yeah, the obstacles about your journey to Christianity. Yeah. yeah, there were lots of obstacles, especially the family obstacle, because oh. uh, being a very sensitive person, I didn't want to hurt my family. I didn't want to mm. hurt my parents. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that was the greatest challenge. In my second year, that was around uh, 2009 at that college, Mark, Mark Feeling came there. Uh, oh, Mark Feeling. Yeah, Pastor Mark Feeling yes. came there. Okay. Yeah, I came for uh, uh, like strong messenger of the Lord. Yeah, two <laughs> weeks, <laughs> two weeks of uh, evangelism there, and it was from Mark Feeling that I finally got a good grasp of the Bible because prior before prior to him coming, I had not studied the Bible, and my friends were challenging me to study the Bible since I was always loving these spiritual conversations with them. And I began to study the Bible, but it was quite a task, you know, mm -hmm. for somebody who didn't grow up with that. I grew up with the Quran. So when he came around and he had these two weeks of evangelism and he talked about all of these uh, major doctrines of the Bible, including uh, the state of the dead, mm -hmm. which actually cuts across my fearful childhood, the things I saw in the movies. Oh, yeah. So that was really instrumental for me. I think, yeah, it was. That was interesting because all of a sudden you grow up with these fears, you know, the demonic visions and the movies that you were showing that developed even into, you know, uh, teenage years, yeah. these fears. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, <laughs> the dead are really dead. Yeah, the dead exactly. are really dead. They're not living, they're yeah. not right. talking to me. They're not spirits that will visit me in yeah. my grave because of my prayers. Yeah. It started, that was quite a revolution. I mean, how, yeah. when yeah. you heard that, I just got to ask, <laughs> yeah, when you heard that for the first time, where was the click? Because, you know, sometimes people say, unbelievable. The aha moment. The aha moment. What was that for you? What was that like? I mean, did you go back to your room and say, I can't, I mean, I can't believe this is actually, <laughs> where do you get to the point where you embrace it? That's the question, really. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I was prepared for it because, like I said, I was already dissatisfied with what I had prior to my coming to the college, and I was already drowning myself in these worldly things. So when that came, that was something beautiful to me. It was beautiful. So I just couldn't resist that truth. Uh -huh. And because it came from the Bible, and as Muslims, there is something about Islam that says that you, sh you should recognize the Bible that the Bible is actually inspired by God, oh. although they have issues with the Gospels and all of these questions right. about uh, the Gospels and everything. But in general, Islam actually recognizes the Bible as inspired. So for me, for those truths to be shown to me from the Bible about the state of the dead and things like that, mm -hmm. it was just too beautiful to, to, to just uh, say no to it. I just, I, I had it up, like I was ready for That's it. So nice. I was ready for it. You know, you go back to the question, why would, and I could see God in this, because the question, why did your parents send you to an Adventist college? And that, was, that also was I know. a God thing, because I wasn't <laughs> supposed to go there. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to go to a public university. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote my entrance examination to that public university, they couldn't find my result, mm -hmm. which is really strange, because I went there after, when it was the time for us to see our results and yeah. then of course see whether I passed or failed or anything but it just said they couldn't find it like they wow. couldn't find my result and my dad was like no you're not going to be home for one more year because that's the implication I had to wait another year to write that exam again 
and they were like, I think you need to go to a private college. Wow. So that's how mm. I ended there. You see the blessing? <laughs> it, it wasn't coincidental now, now that mm. you look back. I don't believe it was. The Lord was closing one door and he was opening another. You know, it reminds me of John uh, 16, 13. Uh, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will lead you and guide you into all, into all truth. And so tell us about your transition now. Yeah. Did you decide to get baptized at that school? I got baptized at that school. Oh. Okay. Yeah, and I would go home during the holidays mm -hmm. and I would still pray as a Muslim because I was so scared to death that my parents would find out I was... Because my dad did tell me that when you go to that college, don't become a Christian because he knows it's a Christian school. Oh. And he did tell me before I went there, don't go there and become a Christian. And I wasn't even planning on it, but it happened because God wanted it to happen that way. Just like you said, what happened with my yeah. public university chance, which closed, was a God thing, I believe, because now today I'm a different person in terms of my fears. Yeah, I'm not the same person I used to be. So yeah, I, w I would go home mm -hmm. and, and I would pray as a Muslim. I would still pray on the mat, like I would you go did? through the motions, yeah, during the holidays. But I know, I remember that I didn't say the Arabic verses now, because most you of didn't the, what? yeah, I, I did see not the say Arabic verses. Oh. Yeah, I did not say the Arabic verses. I was saying the Christian scriptures in my heart because most of those prayers we prayed, uh, you pray them inwards. There are some of them you pray outwards, right. like the morning and the evening ones. But the afternoon prayers you're supposed to pray inwards, so nobody knows what you're saying. And I just said the Christian scriptures in my heart as I went through the motions. <laughs> oh, that was a transition. Your dad period. from yeah. he, losing yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, because I mean I could imagine you send your son away one way and he comes back home another way. How challenging is that in a family? Mm. You know, for example, if a child decides they no longer want to be Islamic and it's the parents. That's the the most dreadful thing you could do to oh. your Islamic parents. Yeah, it's like. Uh, it's like you put in, yeah, spitting in their face kind of oh, thing. Yeah. That's how serious it is in wow. Islam. It's like you're saying, throwing sand in their face and saying mm -hmm. that everything they gave you means nothing, including the Western education they invested in, including how they've done for you, you know, growing up, how they invested in you. You're basically saying that uh, I, I despise all of that. That's what you mean by becoming a Christian. Wow, wow. Because yeah. you almost have to ask yourself, um, when they found out, I need to ask that question. When and they, they did find out. out. Yeah, yeah, they did find out. What was uh, that like? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I did that for the last two years of college because it was a bachelor's. It was four years. So I got baptized in my second year. I remember, I think. And then for the next two years, I was doing this during the holidays. And so they didn't find out till when I was done. So after you finish college in Nigeria, you're supposed to go for a year of service. So that was my chance. I think I have a picture there of my youth service. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. Let's see. Probably they will show that. But um, I, not, no, not, not, not that. that one, but the one prior to that maybe. But anyway, so while I was going for the youth service, I said this is my golden chance because I'm going to be away from home for a year. Mm -hmm. So I only be there to see them break down and everything because I didn't want to see that. So yeah. what I did was I wrote them a letter. Oh. And I sent it to them because while I was waiting for my youth service, mm -hmm. uh, call up later to come because I had to wait okay. for like three months. I went to stay with my Christian friend, the evangelical one mm -hmm. in, yeah, in a yeah. different city. So I said I was going there just to try and find a temporary job before I go for my youth service. But the real reason was I wanted to practice my Christian faith. So okay. I went there on that note and I was with my Christian friend. We would go to church on Sundays and everything because I tended towards evangelical Christian at first. Right. Christianity at first. Yeah. So while I was there for three months, I would go to church every Sunday. I was so happy, you know, being a Christian and everything. And then when that time was coming to an end to come back home and prepare for my youth service, I said, this is the time to tell them. So I wrote them a letter, like a note, an email. I sent it to my younger brother, the one after me. I said, okay. give my parents this letter, tell them to read it, and I'm coming home tomorrow. Oh. Wow. Yeah. So get them ready. I'm on my way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so they read the note, and uh, I arrived the following day, and they had seen everything. They had read everything, because I poured out my heart there, including why I did what I did and how I didn't want to break their hearts and everything. So I just put out my heart in the note. And when I came home the next day, I came at the seven o'clock prayer. I arrived at a seven o'clock prayer. And I told myself that I'm not going to budge. I'm just going to stand for, for what I believe. And I remember that as soon as I came in through, through uh, because we had a fenced, play, a fenced compound, we call it a compound. So as soon as I came through the gate, mm -hmm. I saw my dad 
they had just finished doing the ablution. You know, you have to do the ceremonial washing before you pray. And my dad told me, go and perform your ablution and join us in prayer. And he said it with such a stern voice that I didn't know when I went to do the ablution. I just went and did it oh. and joined them. But I knew that that was going to be the last time I was going to pray like that. I knew that. So I just obeyed and did it. And that night they called me into their room, my parents, both of them, and um, they started asking me questions. But I didn't have to say much because I said everything in the note I sent to them. Oh, yeah. So I just kept asking, did you guys read the note? Did you guys read the note? <laughs> they wanted to hear it from your mouth. They said exactly what my dad said. They want to hear from the horse's mouth. So... I remember my mom was crying so bitterly. She cried and cried and cried and cried. And she did say something that I remember that night. She said, I believe you're going to taste that religion, that other. She actually called it the other side. I believe you're going to taste the other side for a while. I believe you're going to come back. Oh. But even though I was a fresh Christian at this point, I was just starting my Christian journey, I knew it was not going to happen because I knew that I had a personal savior in Christ and that was what I had always wanted. So, Wow. Yeah. Today, I think my mom has changed uh, um, that opinion. That opinion. She has seen how much I've grown and everything that has happened on that journey. I don't think she believes the same that I'll come back. I don't think so. How many years have you been a Christian? So this story I just shared now was in 2012. In 2012. 2012. And it's 2021. So Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So, and I think that your constancy, your consistency is going to be a witness to them. Let's look at another picture here and explain to what, we, what we're seeing here. Yeah, that was the youth service. So oh. it was while I was away that God began to walk in them. This was a kind of like a rural village area where I was posted to uh, teach at a high school as part of my service for okay. one year. Yeah, so after that, I came back home. By the time I came back home, God had begun to heal them. Hmm. Yeah, and I remember my mom would call me in Jesus' name. Huh? Or oh, she would call you in Jesus' name? Yeah, that's what she would She call would? Me. That's what yeah. she called you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's, interesting. that's interesting. Now, I have a question. You being a Muslim, and we've heard for many years that you're ostracized when you're Muslim, you're put out and... I mean, when you become a Christian, you're put out of your home and things like that. They didn't treat you that way. They didn't shun you or anything like that. I think the shunning part happened before I left for the youth service. So after okay, that before. night, yeah, after that night, there was uh, a break in the emotional bond. Mm -hmm. This was so obvious that our hearts were almost like ripped apart and we couldn't communicate in the house. But I remember my mom would tell me, get some food to eat because I wouldn't eat. And after a long silence, maybe almost a day of silence, nobody talking to anyone, nobody speaking to each other, she would say, get some food and all of that. But I remember that like a week later, that happened for like a week, this, this uh, breaking communication and emotional breakdown. But a week later, when I was ready to leave for the youth service, they actually followed me, my parents. They followed me all the way to the village, like hours of travel to where I was going to serve. So I think I have unique parents, I have to say that. Yeah. Because in Nigeria, Islam is it's pretty serious, even in Nigeria, that parents would try to kill their child, That's what especially in the North. Uh, and um, if they don't try to kill the child, they, they disown the child. And these were the thoughts I had in my head, that my parents wouldn't try to kill me. I think they love me enough not to try to kill me, but I think they might disown me. They might say, we don't want to have anything to do with you. But that didn't happen. There was the breakdown for a week. But when they followed me all the way to my, oh. uh, where I was going to stay for a year, I just thought, well, what, what parents I have, Aww. you know. Wow. And, you know, I believe the yeah. Lord was intervening in that respect. He was saying, um, yeah. I know that your heart is sincere. And I like the way you brought this out because for those who may be watching or listening to the program, some people may be at the same place. You might be in the same place between where you are comfortable and where you know God is leading you, mm -hmm. but you have your parents. Mm -hmm. That's a factor. You have the people that you love and care about. You know that they have a heart yes. and you don't want them to feel that you uh, uh, um, disrespect them or right. don't like what they've done for you. And some people tend to get emotional and translate that rather than saying, my son is on his own journey. They look back and say, he's he disrespects everything we did for him. Mm. But God has blessed you in an amazing way. Yeah. And I have to ask you the question, how has the Holy Spirit led you? How has the Holy Spirit led you in your Christian walk? Yeah, so, and the, the part of the Holy Spirit was also very new for me because that was 
fall into the Islamic faith. Mm -hmm. So this is something that I had to learn that I have the Holy Spirit from God who was supposed to guide me in my life journey. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty interesting that I began to actually feel that I had a close uh, person with me, the, like I had this guidance, I had this communication with my heart. I believe that was the Holy Spirit. And that helped me even in my transition from the evangelical Christianity into Adventism because I said I didn't become an Adventist immediately. Hmm. So I tended towards more of what I had learned from my evangelical Christian friend because as I was studying the Bible, I was seeing things about the Savior. That was all I wanted. I just wanted a personal Savior. I didn't want all of these strict rules because I thought they were strict rules because my Adventist friend would say the Ten Commandments, don't do this, don't do that, and all of this. For me, Adventism was like Islam 2.0. Oh. Okay. At first. At first. Right. Yeah, at first. And so I, I was just, I tended towards the uh, Sunday oh. um, evangelical Christian India. I want to reiterate that because that may have yeah, gone so yeah. quickly. Yes. He was saying when you, when you heard about mm -hmm. the rules and the lifestyle of a Christian Adventist, yeah. it was almost like Islam 2.0. Yeah. It's like, okay, because there were so many prohibitions in Islam, now I'm into another religion with a lot of prohibitions. That was your initial the, yeah, that was my attitude initial towards attitude it. Towards but, but how did that change? So three years down the line, so after college, um, three years down the line, I was done with my masters now, yes. and I was working now, yeah. and I was still worshiping on Sunday. And so where I was walking, actually in the north of Nigeria, hours away from where I grew up, I was at church this particular Sunday again. And uh, I remember that a pastor came to the front of the church mm -hmm. and said, okay, he was holding a dress in his hand, just like that. And he was saying, this is the dress. He was holding what? what? A dress. A dress. A dress. Yeah, dress. Okay. a dress in his hand. Oh. And he said, this is the dress that we wore when he said we, he meant himself and other pastors right. uh, of that denomination that we wore this dress to, to a meeting during the week with other pastors and the GO, the general overseer. That's what they call it, the leader of the denomination, general yeah. the general overseer. And that they had this meeting during the week and the general overseer told them, all of the pastors, that when you guys go back to church on Sunday for the service, make sure you hold the dress you guys are wearing for this meeting. Make sure you take the dress to church, hold it in front of the congregation, and tell them anyone who has a problem should come and touch the dress. Hmm. And whatever problems that you have would vanish. Hmm. If you touch the, touch dress. the, touch the dress. That's wow. interesting. <laughs> and uh, I thought to myself, because I should tell you that um, before I went into college, I had an experience. Uh, there was a night I was playing PlayStation, because I did tell you guys sometime, I think before this interview, yeah, yeah. that uh, I think it was mm -hmm. uh, Angela, that my dad was able to buy a PlayStation for us at some point when he could afford it for my, myself and my brothers. So I was playing PlayStation by myself that night in the room, just before I went to college. And I slept afterwards, and I had an experience, actually a demonic experience. Mm. And something came into the room just before I could fall into sleep. Mm. and was harassing me from the back. And it was so strange and so fiery, like it was, I, I see a fiery being. I felt so hot, like a fire thing in the, in the room. And I felt this was so strange because I hadn't even fallen asleep yet. And I was oh. trying to turn my neck to oh. see what this thing yeah. was. And I couldn't, it was as if my neck was stuck from moving. Hmm. And I remember I actually said Jesus at some point. Yes. And when I said that, the thing left. Yes. And uh, I would just leave that story because I remember I, le I went to my mom's room because I was so scared, I was sweating. So this experience, that was the very first time I had, had an experience, but it continued afterwards. So after that first time, it happened every now and then. So even years down the line after I became a Christian and I was uh, worshiping every Sunday, like I said, I was still having that experience every now and then. Whenever I try to fall asleep, this thing comes into the room and harasses me. Uh, mm -hmm. from falling into sleep. And so when the pastor said that, that came to my mind. Oh, the dress. So I'm like, I should go touch the dress because uh, this thing that harasses me, I don't know oh. what it is. Maybe I'll stop having that experience. So yeah. I did go touch the dress as well. Okay. And I remember I went back to my seat and I fell to the ground and I was rolling on the ground and I was screaming in tongues. Of course, that's what we call the tongues yeah. uh, in the Sunday churches. Mm -hmm. So, and everywhere in the church was full of people screaming in tongues oh. and there were people rolling on the floor. There were ladies in front, almost naked in front while rolling on the floor and everything. Wow. So after the service, cause I was living with a friend uh, in this uh, city where I was working, mm -hmm. 
So my friend was driving and he asked me a question. He said, um, he called me by my, by my cultural name. He said, okay, I mean, why did you fall down in the church? Yeah. And huh. I was almost like, are you serious? Are you asking me that question? And he said, yeah, why did you fall? And I'm like, that doesn't make sense. People fell. I mean, everybody, everybody was falling. So what do you mean, why did I fall? He said, then he said, was it because you did not have breakfast? So he was kind of playing about this because I actually didn't have breakfast that morning. He said, is it because you didn't have breakfast? And I felt he was playing. He was trying to make a joke oh, right. out of it. Yeah. And that really got to me because I felt what happened was a divine thing. And I said, shut up, shut up. Stop saying that if you don't want God to strike you. I mean, I was so... Yeah. I was so infuriated, yeah, yeah. By, his, uh, uh, by his pranks. Yeah. So, but when we got home, I began to think about it, reflect about, on his question. Yes. And he didn't even know that, but I was thinking deeply. I said, does this even make sense? I remember the ladies in front of the church were rolling almost naked in front of the church. And I was yeah. like, is this what is this biblical God? Christianity? Is this really right. what Christianity is about? So, and then I began to remember my conversations with my Adventist friend how his uh, Christianity was very decent. It was not all of this emotionalism and all of that. And I said, I should probably go study, not even ask him because at this point I was very confident in my ability to study the Bible for myself. So I said, let me try and study how the things he tried to tell me at school. And that was what I did. And after two weeks of intensive study, because I want to make sure, I told myself if I was going to leave Islam, I need to do something that is true. Solid and something true. that is true, something that is biblical. So I began to do this research myself for about two weeks. And I was sure at the end of my story that uh, Adventism was the biblical Christianity. Amen, oh, amen. Wow. wow. You know, our time is running away from us and you have so much to share with us. I want to go through a few this more pictures. Advent Family and Missions. Talk we got to that. talk Let's about talk that. About what mission. is the Advent Family Missions? Yeah, so I met this lady, um, Sometime before I went to the mission school in Nigeria, so I just left my job. You we were talking about how the Holy Spirit has led me. So the Holy Spirit, yeah, that's all right there. That's the lady you met. Yeah, so the Holy Spirit, I believe, was convincing me to leave what I was doing, my regular job, for something deeper, that God wanted to lead me to something more deep than what I was experiencing. And I, at some point, I let God guide me, and I was in the mission school in Nigeria. And around that time, I met a lady right there, and uh, she was just about to finish... Uh, uh, bachelor's in, in Bible instruction from a college in Nigeria. And so I met her after I left my job, so I wouldn't have even met her if I didn't follow God's guidance for my life. So, so while she was finishing her bachelor's in Bible instruction, I was at this mission school in Nigeria right. where I heard about Heartland College. Oh. So, okay. yeah, that was how I came to the States because I heard about Harlan College while I was at that mission school. That's right. Yeah, so to answer your question about Advent yes. Family Missions, yeah, we intend to have a family ministry together. Yeah, and she's Adventist. She, she grew and up Adventist. And who is she in your life? How is she... Who is she in your life? She's my fiance. There you oh, go. Okay. Yeah, she's my fiance. Yeah. You know my wife is going to bring that out. <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, Getting ready to get married. Yeah, I'm going to get married. Mm -hmm. Praise, Praise the, Lord. the Lord. Let's look at the next picture here because we want to point out that you said you're going to be starting a ministry together. Yeah. And, and, and uh, is yeah, that? Yeah, uh, what is that? Oh, yeah. So this is the ministry that she started. Okay. Ah. Yeah. So it's called Young Gospel Advocates because she likes to... Um, organize conferences, yearly conferences. So since 2017, when I met her, I met her late 2016. So 2017, she organized a Bible conference and we have that picture right there. And I went there as a friend, she inv invited me to come to share. And I shared and there was, there was a baptism, some young people got baptized. There's a picture I think I have there. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's a ministry that she started for Bible conferences in Nigeria. Okay, oh, there that's, Yeah, is. that's right. the picture right there, yeah. Okay. Mm, yeah. Now the Lord has blessed your life and we're not going to talk too much about it today, but there's a book entitled, a book actually wrote called Saving Fearful. <laughs> and uh, the title is amazing because it has to do with coming out of the fears of growing up, ah. the fears of disappointing your parents, yeah. mm. the fears of your experience even into your mm. uh, educational years. Yeah. But then the word saving is a big part of that. Mm -hmm. What made you choose that title just before we uh, go to our news break here? Absolutely. So uh, 
person, even the picture. I, 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 I believe that, yeah, and the, the picture tells a story as well, I because in that picture, I was yeah. at church, at my local church in Nigeria, the Seventh-day Adventist church there, and I didn't know what the future held for me. So mm. I remember it was after the service on Sabbath, I stood there through that window, mm. and someone took a picture of me, and when I look at that picture, it's me staring into the future, not knowing what the future held for me. Oh, okay, yeah. I get it. Yeah, so seven fearful is just, uh, I'm like fearful personified as a child and into my teenage life. So God had to save, to save me somehow. Wow. And you've also worked at Strong Tower Radio. Yeah, that was my internship site. Yeah, because I said I went to Heartland for uh, my training when I came to the States, and I went to Strong Tower Radio in Michigan for my internship. Yeah. That's right. Well, I want to also give some information because you might want to get in touch with Samson Fidemaye to uh, find out more about maybe inviting him and more about his story and even getting access to his book. So here is the information that you're going to need. Advent Family Missions works in collaboration with churches and other ministries to conduct missionary work in Nigeria, West Africa, and beyond, preparing people for the coming of Jesus. For more information about them or to support their efforts, please visit their website, adventfamilymissions.org. That's adventfamilymissions.org. You may also call them at country code 234-810-603-4266. Their email address is mission at adventfamilymissions.org. That's mission at adventfamilymissions.org. Well, friends, our time comes and goes so quickly, but there's a point that Samson Fidemaye wants to bring out. We had been talking about this prior to the program. Uh, you saw evangelical Christianity, and you were told by them that the law of God was abolished, but still thievery and murder was an issue that kept bringing you back to God's law. What was the turning point in you becoming an Adventist Christian? Yeah, it was really the Sabbath, uh, the Sabbath commandment, uh, which says remember. Yes. And I had this friend, the evangelical friend I mentioned, who said you could do all of these things. So far you have faith, the law is already done away with. But I had those questions. When the Sabbath law came, part came for me, that really did it for me because I saw how it was the central part of God's law, mm -hmm. how we're going to keep it in heaven. And all of this came together for me at the end. So. Yeah, that really convinced me that God's law is still abiding, and I knew about all of the ceremonial laws that were done away with, mm -hmm. but God's moral law, the Ten Commandments, is still abiding. Wow. And it's the only one that says, remember. Remember. That's remember. right. <laughs> and praise the Lord in your consistency. You're showing that to your parents, to oh, your evangelical friends. That's right. And we're going to pray that in your life as you continue and into your marriage, yeah. that the law of God will maintain its central focus in your life. Yeah. And I want to once again say, uh, we're not going to talk about selling the book, but if you want to get a copy of this, I think it's going to be an amazing story, Saving Fearful. And when you get in touch with Samson Fidemaye, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Any encouraging words to him, honey? I just praise the Lord for your journey. It's just wonderful. It's a testimony to the people, young people especially, to show how God is using you in such a beautiful way. And we just pray that God continue to guide you, which He will. Amen. And thank you for sharing with us. And thank where you did you get your degree? Me. You got your degree in... Uh, oh, uh, Associates of Christian Media Ministry. Christian Media. Okay. Christian Media Ministry. Christian yeah. So Media. you'll be able to use those tools to lead others to the Absolutely. loving Savior yeah, God's grace. and the truth of God's Word. Yeah, God's grace. Well, thank you, friends, for joining us. You know, this has been a thought-provoking question, but there's so much more to the story. We pray that you'll get in touch with Samson to hear the rest of the story. But until we see you again, may the blessings of God's Word and the truth of God continue to abide in your heart. See you in the future. God bless you. Amen.